Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, members of Berean Baptist Church and the Facebook universe. Welcome to our Sunday morning service, our 11 o'clock service. I am so glad that you are here uh, to attend with us. And uh, we're going to start out by singing some songs, and we're Palm Sunday. This is Palm Sunday, and so we're going to be singing about Christ, and we're going to be singing about the cross. But the first song is number 353 for those of the Red Baptist Church. If you have your gray song books, we're singing Victory in Jesus. Protected during 
this time. So we pray, Lord, that you would be the divine protector. We pray you would give a divine wisdom to those in charge, our president, our vice president, uh, the medical community. And we thank you, Lord, that though some of them have great amounts of medical expertise, that many of them are also praying to you for healing. And so we pray, Lord, for healing, certainly not only the physical healing, but also uh, spiritual healing and uh, spiritual rebirth that you would work in hearts and lives that people would be drawn to you because you are the one who has the answers above all else. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And um, at this time, we're going to sing a couple more songs here. Um, looking here, number 327 in your book. And as we look at this Palm Sunday, and as we look at everything that Jesus has done for us, uh, it makes sense that we would be pointing to the cross of Jesus Christ at this time. Because he gave himself for you, and he gave himself for me. So let's sing this song.
it's just a chorus, but it says, learning to lean. And uh, boy, that is uh, making a huge statement. We all like to think that we do lean on the Lord. We all like to think that we do lean on Jesus. And then we have something like this happen, and we realize we're back in school again. And uh, we realize maybe we haven't leaned on the Lord like we should. This sure helps us. Uh, this is a teachable time as we learn to lean on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's sing this chorus through a couple of times. Learning to lean, learning to lean, I'm learning to lean on
Praise God, there's going to come a day you're not going to be sitting in your living room anymore. And uh, the wonderful thing is we're going to be able to assemble together, and that will, that will take place. Uh, now, some of you are feeling like me. What in the world do we do uh, regarding Resurrection Sunday? Uh, the stay-at-home orders are still in place. And I want you to know that I'm working very hard and very specifically to try to make Resurrection Sunday special uh, for us. And so you just pray for me uh, as I continue to, to just work on things. And uh, because next Sunday is a very important day, the most important day in all of eternity, and that is the day when Jesus rose from the dead. And because he rose from the dead, he showed he had power over sin. He shows that he has power over death. Shows he has power over eternity. And uh, we need a Savior. And uh, some of you, as I have, we made a decision in our lives, a specific point in time, where we made a choice to receive Christ as our personal Savior. And understand to all of you, there has to be a day you make a choice. It doesn't happen accidentally. It doesn't happen automatically. You are not born a Christian any more than being born in a garage would make you a car. A person needs to be born again. And uh, that's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. He says, Nicodemus, you're missing the boat here. You need to be born again. There's a spiritual birth that has to happen, and that happens by receiving Jesus Christ as Savior. And so we're going to sing another song uh, to my wife at the piano, Debbie. Thank you for helping so much. And uh, that song will be number 294. And also uh, our Facebook administrator and uh, helping with sound. And, um, and we just we kind of run around like chickens with our head cut, heads cut off in this big sanctuary. Uh, but we try to get it done. We try to get it done for you to be a little bit of an encouragement to you. 294, the song is One Day. And so we're going to sing this one. We're going to sing, uh, let me look at this here. Wow, they're all so good. And I'm trying to sing them. You know what? I've got time. Let's sing through all five verses. Your voice isn't perfectly in shape yet anyway. Uh, our choir director would say that you need a little bit of uh, exercise so you're back in shape when the choir meets again. So we'll go through all of them here. Uh, 294, one day. One day.
It is a certainty. Jesus is coming back. Are you ready for his return? Please look with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of John. Looking in the book of John, uh, again, just thank you for everybody who is helping this morning. Um, honey, you're my amen section. You're my amen or my oh me section. And so the rest of you, you're just going to have to text it in. You're just going to have to comment it in. Amen. Oh me. You know, why did you say that? How did you know? How did you know that was my sin? You know, that type of thing. You can text those in. Actually, don't text that in because it'll tell us who you are. So don't do that. But um, let's uh, spend some time in the book of John, chapter 13, looking at verse 21. And we right now are in the vicinity of the Lord's uh, Supper, the Lord's Table. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more on that tonight to our congregation. I am very sorry that we can't share in the Lord's Table. We usually do that on Palm Sunday. Uh, but I do still want to talk um, a, a bit about the topic and remembering uh, that very, very important time with Jesus and the disciples. And I'll talk more about that tonight. John chapter 13, looking at verse 21. The Bible says, When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit, and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that... One of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. By the way, if, if you know anything about scripture, uh, in the book of John, when it talked about the disciple whom Jesus loved, John never mentioned who he was. He just referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, said unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a saw when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the saw, and that is a piece of bread that he dipped, and it could have been water, it could have been, um, could have been grape juice or something. It says, when he had dipped the saw, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the saw, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, he was the treasurer, by the way, that Jesus said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the saw, went immediately out, and it was night. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray now as we come into clear focus at a specific point in time, a point that is literally only hours before Christ's betrayal, that we understand your providence in all of this, that we understand this precursor to great sadness and yet at the very same time, the precursor to great hope. And help us to learn of you and your power and your victory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a term that I'm going to give to you this morning. The term is called double cross. Now, the definition of double cross, it is a Betrayal by someone who seems to be cooperating with you. Um, Julius Caesar had a quote-unquote friend named Brutus who literally took a knife and stabbed him in the back. To which he said to him, et tu Brutus, et tu me, you too, you're against me too. It was a great betrayal and it could 
be clearly defined as something that is called a double cross. When somebody supposedly is trying to help you, let me give you an idea. Say you're trying to invest something and somebody says, you can invest with me, you can trust me, and you invest with that person, and then you discover the next week that they've moved away, no forwarding address. That is called a double cross. That is called a betrayal. And of all the betrayers in human history, fewer are better known than Judas Iscariot. Judas is considered the ultimate betrayer and many, many, many people, perhaps a majority of people in the world, they may not know a lot about God and they may not know a lot about Jesus, but they know the concept of betrayal of Judas be, be betraying Jesus. Now, when you hear Jesus speaking to Judas and he gives him instructions and he says, that thou doest do quickly. What a strange statement. He's already said, the person who's betraying me is, I'm giving this up, I'm giving to him, he's a betrayer, and then after that after he says, what thou doest do quickly, it almost sounds like Jesus is in on it. And you know what? He is. But not in the way that Judas thinks, and not even in the way that Satan thinks. And what you are having the stage set for is what is the greatest double cross in human history. In fact, the title of the message this morning is called The Divine Double Double Cross. And we're going to go through here and show how there was betrayal upon betrayal here that ended in victory and it's important for you to understand because you can be partaker in the victory. It's often been said when you're in a time of war, deception is just a necessary factor in a time of war. In Persian Gulf I, which wound up being only the Hundred Day War, one of the reasons that the war in the Persian Gulf against Saddam Hussein at that time, when he invaded Kuwait around 1990, the reason it was over so fast is because of something called deception. There was literally a place where the American soldiers and the Allies on purpose gathered their forces in one location to give the deception to Saddam Hussein that the incursion was going to take place in one specific spot. Guess what Saddam Hussein did? He concentrated all of his Republican Guard in that one spot. And then when it took place, there were two other sets of mass forces back away from the line, and they just kicked in those tanks at 60 miles an hour, and they went boom, and they came across. It was a master betrayal. Now let me talk about this. Scripture is very, very familiar with the concept of double cross. Has anybody ever heard of a Jacob and Esau? That was a double cross. And, and we look at that double cross, and first of all, you've got the double cross that took place when, um, when Jacob says, hey, I'll, I, you know, you don't want that birthright anyway. I've got a little bit of lentils here. Why don't you eat this? You'll feel better. And uh, that was a little bit of a deception there. Though Esau was in on it, he wasn't in on the next one. The next one where Rebecca dressed up Jacob in goat skin so he could be smelly, which tells you something about Esau. They said Esau is a hairy man. But he was more than a hairy man. He was a smelly man. He forgot to brush. He didn't have deodorant. He didn't know where the shower was. He was more than a hairy man. He was a smelly man. And so Rebecca had to somehow get Jacob to be a hairy, smelly man to make the deception work. And the deception did work, by the way. 
And so when all was done and Esau came, asked his father for his blessing, he says, I can't give it to you. I already gave it to you. He said, what? He says, I haven't been here. And so all of a sudden, Isaac realized there had been a double cross. And Esau realized there had been a double cross. And, and Abraham said to his son, Thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? The word Jacob, the name Jacob, means supplanter or deceiver. For he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. So scripture is familiar with the concept of double cross. By the way, who is the best person to double cross <clears throat> someone who's double cross? It, the deceiver is the one who's most easily deceived. So now we fast forward and some of you have heard of e Jacob and Esau and maybe you've also heard of Laban and Jacob and there was, a, there was a girl involved. You know, every movie that has great drama, there is a girl involved there somewhere. And what you have here is you have intrigue, you have a girl, you have another girl, you've got two daughters, you've got an uncle, you've got a uh, deceiving used car salesman nephew, and you have a perfect recipe for theatrical double cross. And here it comes. And so in Genesis chapter 29 and verse 18, you have the fact that Jacob was in love. It's now playing out like a Hallmark movie, except for the ending. And it says, and Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, deal. The only problem is, is when wedding time came, uh, Laban did not take Jacob to door number one. He took Jacob blindfolded to door number two. And so if you look at verse 22, it says, And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Because you had to have a big feast. Because you have to understand, you're in a place, I'm sorry, nobody has LED flashlights. And, you know, and nobody has lights that go on at night. And so you're talking about out there in the prehistory somewhere. And so they had to have a feast. They had to have that feast go late, late, late in the night. So that when Laban gave Jacob his bride, he couldn't see who it was until morning. And this is what happened. And Laban gave it unto, it says here, and when it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and with the rest is well-known betrayal, double-cross history. And so he wound up marrying, his, marrying Rachel's sister instead of marrying Rachel. Okay, men out there right now, how many of you, how would you feel that happened to you? You went to marry the lady of your dreams, and you woke up in the morning, and it was her sister. How many of you would be good with that? Okay? Jacob wasn't good with that either, but it worked out pretty well for a lady who says, Hey, listen, she's the oldest. i got to marry the oldest off first, you know? And so, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll let you have two for two. Not two for one, but two for two. Seven years, seven more years, and everything's going to be just okay, fine for me. I mean you. So, this is what happened. Scripture is familiar with the concept of double cross. And this is the double cross of man. But Scripture is also familiar with the concept of double cross when it comes to the divine. Look with me in the book of Esther. Turn with me to Esther chapter 7. By the way, uh, you'll find Esther just before the book of Job. You'll find Job uh, just before the book of Psalms. But looking at Esther chapter 7, and this is a concept of double cross, 
where the devil thought he had a wonderful plan to destroy the Jews. By the way, the devil has been trying to destroy the Jews for generations. Number one, because they're God's chosen people. Number two, because at this time, um, even the devil knew, knowing what he knew of the scripture, that the Messiah, the Deliverer, would come from the Jews. So he's trying to destroy the Jewish race to prevent God's plan from taking place. And so you have Mordecai, you had his niece, Esther, who became the queen, by the way. And then you had evil, dastardly, dirty Haman. And Haman hatched a vicious plan to destroy the Jewish race. But there was a double cross. God turned things around. And if you look at Esther chapter 7, looking at verse 9, we see here the, the turnaround here where Haman was supposed to be the killer. That's not what happened. And Harbona, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold! The gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. And you would call this poetic justice, but it is also God's double cross of Satan's plan. It wouldn't be the first time. Go to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. Um, Daniel, an incredibly wise man. Uh, for those of you who are, were listening in the graveside service, Daniel, a man with an excellent spirit. Daniel, a man preferred above, preferred above by kings, preferred above by God, and then because of that, for the devil, public enemy number one. And so the devil, through the jealousy of the Chaldeans, hatched a plan, a surefire way to get Daniel to be destroyed and to be killed, and that was simply to make worshiping God illegal. Daniel wasn't going to stop doing what Daniel was doing. Daniel had worshiped God most of his life, and he wasn't about to stop now. By the way, Daniel was in his 80s at that time. But it didn't matter to him. And so what happened is, he went and he opened his windows toward Jerusalem and prayed three times a day as he had a four time. He did not change anything. He was not ashamed of his God. And they caught him. They arrested him. They threw him in the den of lions. And guess what God did? God rescued them and saved them from the den of lions. Something else that God did that right there, God at that point also did this. He turned Darius into a man of prayer because Darius prayed the entire night for his friend Daniel and he saw that it works to pray to the right person. Not the pagan gods, but to pray to the God of the ages, the God who made heaven and earth, the God who really makes the difference, not the God that's of wood, not the God that is stone, but the real God who is the Lord of lords. And he prayed to him, and his prayers were answered. And the devil was defeated again, because look at verse 22. Daniel talks about it. My God hath set his angel, and hath shut the lion's mouths, that they have not hurt me for as much as before him innocency was found in me. And also before the old king, I have done no hurt. Have I done no hurt? <clears throat> then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found on him because he believed in his God. We have a problem. Here's the problem. Those lions are still hungry. And they've had nothing to eat. They've had no Oreo cookies. They've had no fruit roll-ups. They've had no snacks. They've had no goldfish crackers. They haven't had anything. And they are so, so hungry. What shall we do for these poor 
poor, deprived, emaciated lions. Can you imagine? PETA would have a field day for with this. Why are you starving those lions? We need to protect those lions. And so they came up with the perfect idea. Hey, these lions are hungry. We'll feed them people. <laughs> Just not Daniel. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives, and the lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces, or ever they came at the bottom of the den. And what you have here is you have a divine double cross that took place. The devil thought he had everything sewn up and there was a double cross. So that brings us to the topic. First of all, scripture is familiar with the concept of double cross. But when it came to the divine double, double cross, this is the second point, the devil didn't see it coming. So, let us first look at the devil's master plan and what happened here. Back at John, we're in John chapter 13, go back to John chapter 12, and this is how the plan was hatched by one of the 12 disciples. And looking in John chapter 12, verse 4, it said, Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Understand the context here. A woman has come. She's poured ointment all over Jesus Christ, precious, costly perfume, which Jesus says she knows what she's doing. She's anointing me for my burial. And, and wherever... Uh, the gospel is spoken. This woman shall be spoken of. In fact, she is in all the gospels because of that. But Judas wasn't real happy with this. And it tells why he wasn't happy. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence? 300 pence, by the way, was 300 days wage. Why wasn't this sold for 300 days wage? And given to the poor. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear that what was put therein. You see, because of covetousness, Judas Iscariot was the weak link of Jesus' 12 disciples. He thought, you know what? If we get 300 days wages in this bag, this bag is going to get really heavy, and I'm just going to have to lighten the load. He had a weak leak. He loved money rather than loving God. And because he loved money rather than loving God, he was the logical weak link for Satan to use. Because even Jesus said in Scripture, you cannot serve God and mammon. There is no middle ground between God and money. You are either going to be addicted to the Lord or you're going to be addicted to money, but there's nothing in between. And Judas was the weak link. And the other strange thing is, at this point we go, okay, so we have Judas working the devil's double cross in that Judas is going to be the betrayer, Judas acting like Jesus, I'm with you, but getting ready to betray him, that will be the double cross. But then you also have Jesus going, okay, Judas, I know what you're up to, but I'll go along with it. Setting up the double, double cross. Look with me in scripture. Look here at Luke chapter 22. The book of Luke chapter 22. Look at verse 52. And where it says, And Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come against him, Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves? When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me. Then he says this, But this is your hour and the power of darkness. And this shows what Jesus was willing to do and the devil was happy to have Jesus do it. And you'll be happy in a moment too. Where it says 
in Philippians 2 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So you've got the double cross afoot. You have the devil who has betrayed Jesus. You have Jesus going along with it to death. And you have the devil not realizing that this is not going to be the path of victory for him. Because you see, here is what the devil was thinking. The devil was thinking, I've got the keys to hell. And Jesus is going to die, he's going to descend to hell, or at that time, Sheol and the grave, and I'm going to be his jailer. I have the keys to the jail. Now let me give you an explanation here for those of you who are not familiar with this. Prior to Jesus rising from the dead, there was a holding place for all mankind who had passed away. It was called, it was called Sheol. And this place was this big, huge place. Um, many, many theologians believe it's in the center of the earth, the deeper parts of the earth, for a simple reason. The scripture says it is, so that's a good enough reason. And in there, you had two parts. You have one side that is called hell or Hades. It is a place of torment, a place for those who were sinful against God, a place where people did not have faith in God, did not trust in God. And so you have that place. Then you have this great chasm fixed in between. And then over on the other side, you have a place that is called the bosom of Abraham or paradise which is a place where there's no, no torment, there is great comfort, but it's still confinement. It's still not heaven. And so you have Jesus who is going to die on the cross for your sins and my sins, and after he dies, he has one place that he has to go, and that is down. And we have that, by the way, in the authority of Scripture. If you look in the book of Ephesians, Chapter 4, you have that description in the book of Ephesians. Where it says, quite frankly, this in Ephesians 4, and we're looking at verse 9. It says, now that he ascended, that's talking about the resurrection of Christ. It says, now that he ascended, what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? And so what you have, Satan did not realize the double cross until Jesus entered hell. And when Jesus entered hell, he went, I got you. Because Satan goes, if I lock Jesus up, then the entire human race is mine. And so Jesus comes and he's acting like, you got me. And the devil opens the door to the cell and says, go on in. And Jesus goes on in. And when he goes to close the cell and to lock the cell, he can't find the keys. And Jesus is on the other side going, looking for these. And Jesus takes the keys and he unlocks the gate. And how do we know that? Because Jesus told us in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 18, he said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. And so Jesus at that point, he unlocks the good side. He unlocks the paradise blues of Abraham's side, says, hey guys, come along with me. And off they went. And the double cross took place. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8 describes it. Wherefore he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Saying he led captivity. He set the prisoners free and took them up to heaven with them. And the wonderful thing about this double, double cross is Jesus' double cross of Satan it is final and it is 
eternal, and there's nothing the devil can do about it ever again for all eternity. It was the divine double, double cross. Looking at Romans chapter 6, verse 9, it says, Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. What does that mean for me? What does that mean for you? Jesus doesn't have to die anymore. He did it once. It's done. Death no longer has dominion over him. He cannot die again. He will not die again. He has power over death. And he is now has dominion over death. It is permanent and it is eternal. And looking also in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and looking in verse 24 where it says, Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And we have here the reality that Jesus is the victor over death. And one of the enemies that Jesus has destroyed by rising from the dead is death itself has been destroyed. It no longer has to have a permanent hold on any of mankind. And as we had a graveside service yesterday, the most wonderful thing about the graveside service is that, is that the man that we were speaking about, he received Christ. He was a saint, and he now is in heaven because death does not have dominion over him. He did not have to have his spirit descend into the lower parts of the earth, which, by the way, still happens with those who have never received Christ. But for those who are saved, they're immediately present with the Lord. So understand this. Jesus double crosses. Satan is final and eternal. And understand this. Jesus double cross took place on a single cross where he died for your sins, for me, and he shed his blood for you and me, and he paid the price for all eternity. He took on your death for you. Amen. So you would not have to have it. And Jesus is in the business of setting people free. So understand this. If you have received Christ as your personal Savior for eternal salvation, you're a winner already. Death doesn't have any hold on you. Death, earthly death, is just a door you pass through. And by the way, once you pass through the door... If their escalators are only going one direction, they're going up. But that is why it's so important that you know for sure in your heart and your life that you've trusted Christ as your personal Savior. Now, for those of you who have already made that decision and you're living here on planet Earth, can I please give you this exhortation? Don't be double-crossed. Don't let the devil who is already lost to Jesus win with you even in this earthly life because the bible talks about this um, the devil is not taking this sitting down he is still looking for people to double cross first peter chapter 5 verse 8 be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour so there are four deceptions don't get double-crossed by any of those these four deceptions. First of all, as I already talked about, don't get double-crossed by the deception of things. As the Bible says, looking at Luke chapter 12, verse 15, Jesus said this to his disciples, and he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesses. This is important for you to understand. If you value money, Satan has you on a string. He has some control in your life. When it comes to what you possess, 
Either there is stewardship, which means what do I do with what God has, including what I have, or there's idolatry, I have to follow the money. There's either stewardship, there's idolatry, there's no middle ground. Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. Don't be double-crossed. Don't be deceived. The deception of things. And then there's the deception of sin. That somehow thinking because you're saved and you're on your way to heaven, then all of a sudden, since you've got to get out of hell free card, that somehow you can sin and not be harmed by it. There's nothing further from the truth. The scripture says in Psalm 94, verse 7, Yet they say the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. Understand, ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when will ye be wise? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chastiseth the heathen, shall he not correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall he not know? Understand this. Don't be deceived into thinking that God is not paying attention. And don't be deceived into thinking that sin has no consequence. In Romans chapter 6 verse 21 it said, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Don't let your life be ruined by the deception of sin. And then thirdly, is the deception of a false religion. Don't let Jesus trip you up with false religion. And I could be talking to those who are saved. I could be talking about those who dabble with everything else that seems more interesting and things that seem more popular. But it is, it is, a, it is uh, the term that they use. And it's okay, I forgot the term, so that's good. You know, we call this the derailment of the train of thought. It's a Trojan horse trained back on the track. It's a Trojan horse. And so it says, as we look in scripture, Isaiah 42, 17. It says, they shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed that trust in graven images that say to the molten images, ye are our gods. Don't fall into the deception of false religion because there is no greater betrayal in your life or in a person's life to subscribe to a system of belief that when at the end of life, when confronted by the portals of eternity, has turned out to betray you. Don't be betrayed by false religion. Don't go with things that somebody wrote on a napkin. Don't go by things where somebody says they had a vision or something like that. Go with the Word of God, the precious Word of God. By the way, the most best-selling book in the world, and it stands the test of time. Why would you think God would want to deceive you? He wants you to know the truth. And also, don't be deceived by time. Don't be deceived by thinking, I have all the time in the world. I have all the time in the world to serve God. I have all the time in the world to do something for the Lord. I have all the time in the world to live right. I have all the time in the world to change my ways. I have all the time in the world to get saved. The Bible says in Luke 12, 20, But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. God knows the day and the hour and the moment of your death, and you don't. So why would you leave it to chance? Don't be deceived. Don't be double-crossed by the devil. Here's the wonderful thing. There is access because of what Jesus has done, because of his double, double cross, because of winning the war against Satan. There is access to eternal life, and that access is right now. 
Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, he said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. But it comes to verse 26, is the crossroads of every person's life. And as Jesus was talking to the religious leaders of the day, he says, But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. It is a great idea to join the flock. To join the flock of Christ. The sheep that Jesus protects. To become a born-again child of God. Not having to run around in circles of life anymore without hope, with the worry, the endless worry of what happens next. And that has to be one of the greatest fears that exists right now during this epidemic is people are going, what is next? You do not have to worry. You do not have to fear. When the worst thing that could possibly happen in your life is that you would die and go straight to heaven, that is not a bad thing. But you have to believe. And for those of you that are saved, yes, you are saved, but the devil is still on the prowl. Do not let the devil double-cross you. Let us have the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Please use your word in our hearts today. And Lord, I do pray for those who, maybe they haven't made a choice. Maybe they haven't made a decision. Uh, they're just viewing in because they're curious. They may be viewing in because they're religious, but they just think they have time. And you and I both know they don't. I pray that you would use this time for good in our lives. And help us draw closer to you. And help us trust you. And help us not to be deceived. For the devil is a great deceiver. And help us to work and live rightly before you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to sing a final song. That song is number 310. 310, look with me. If you have a gray song book, 310, lead me to Calvary. And let's sing this song together as a closing song.
the service this morning. I saw something yesterday as I was driving down the street, obviously, essentially driving back to my home. But what I saw is I saw an entire family out on a walk. Mom, dad, the children, all doing something together, the same thing at the same time. And when everybody goes, oh, this thing is so bad, let me say this. If it builds families back together, that is a beautiful thing. And that can be a long-term help to our country. I encourage you to do the same. Since you're together in the same house anyway, work on things together. Build your home right now. God bless you. And have a wonderful afternoon. I will see you at 6 o'clock.